Greetings from the Dark Continent, Conscious Caracal here with another Culture Series episode, episode 6. And in this episode, we're going to be exploring South African Portuguese culture, uh, a culture that I think a lot of people internationally aren't aware of that it's actually a thing. Uh, but in South Africa, I think uh, the majority of South Africans have uh, done business with a Portuguese South African. I think it's an unmissable facet of, of the South African cultural landscape. So I'm very excited to welcome my good friend, uh, Quentin Ferreira, back on the show. He's a regular on the channel, and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Welcome to the show, Quentin. Thank you so much, Ernesto, Elsa, I should say, obrigado. And if you've dealt with a Portuguese person in business, you maybe have heard, no change, take chappies. <laughs> so maybe just a little disclaimer before we continue. As I say, uh, when I start any of these uh, culture series episodes, I'm not talking to academics. I'm not talking to experts of their culture. I'm not talking to people that have written books on their culture. I'm talking to regular people that have an appreciation for their culture, that have something to share, and people that can give us an insight from boots on the ground in regards to how they view their culture today and where they see it in the future. So maybe just uh, so I did uh, some research uh, on Portuguese culture before uh, this episode. So maybe just uh, and this this is uh, common knowledge, but I just wanted to make sure I got my facts correct. So in the South African context, uh, the Portuguese navigator Barth Bartholomew Dias reached the southern tip of Africa in 1488 and was the first European to sail around it and named it the Cape of Good Hope. So if you're an international viewer and you've heard the term Cape of Good Hope, um, that's where it originated. And then later, Vasco da Gama, a Portuguese explorer as well, was the first European to reach India around this route that uh, Diaz had championed. And this was in between 1497 and 1499. So, Quentin, in regards to Portuguese culture, and maybe to, to get the conversation started, what, what would your elevator pitch be in regards to the history of the Portuguese at the southern tip of Africa? Okay, well, yeah, the, the history of the Portuguese um, in terms of their global empire, I think, is, is super, super interesting. So um, the history of the Portuguese in the southern tip of Africa was a long time in the making. So you're right to say, uh, Bartolomeu Dias uh, found South Africa or the Cape of Good Hope in 1488. And um, when they reached India, they'd actually been looking for India for 60 years. So it was a, a huge undertaking. Um, the king at the time was is called Henry the Navigator, always known as Henry the Navigator, because he started the age of discovery. So initially, they weren't really looking for Southern Africa. They were looking to pass and and find um, and find India because that was where all the spices were. And the thing about Portugal is, if you know, obviously, geographically, Portugal is kind of located on the westernmost point in Europe, and it's surrounded entirely by uh, Spain. And, I mean, Spain is a, a great country, but the best thing about Spain is the road to Portugal. However, um, Portugal, during the, the 1400s, 1500s, um, Portugal was kind of left out of a lot of the growth in Europe. Um, and the spice trade was over land, and it was the Venetians and the Ottomans that had kind of the, the monopoly on the spice trade into Europe. So all the Portuguese had really was the Atlantic Ocean in front of them and great skill at building boats and excellent skill at navigation. Um, but they were surrounded by empires. Surrounded by, yeah, uh, the Spanish, first of all, and then um, the the Umayyad Caliphate to the south, um, which is also a significant part of Portugal's history, you know, having been colonized by um, an Islamic caliphate and then being the oldest uh, country in that uh, side of the world, um, having overthrown the Moors, I think it was in 1139, they had the battle the, called the Reconquista, where uh, they kicked the Moors out of Portugal and established a Catholic kingdom. So long story short, well, it, it, it is a journey um, of a lot of pain, a lot of suffering, um, and a lot of triumph, but constantly having to just keep pushing and just keep going out into the unknown with a belief and a hope that, you know, your mission is going to pay off. And I think that that's a great metaphor for the Portuguese community, not only in South Africa, but around the world. It's like chartering unknown territories, 
going in there with a belief, never, um, never giving up and hoping that uh, your endeavors will bear fruit. And there's no coincidence. The Portuguese word for exploitation and exploration is the same word. So it's exploração, uh, explorar, to exploit and to explore. And I think that's kind of the genesis of the culture that uh, people know of when they think of Portugal today. Yeah, uh, well, from what you described, uh, I would reckon the, the cultural symbol uh, of the Portuguese would be the open horizon. That's right, man. That's right. Um, the, the ocean plays a super huge role in, in Portuguese culture. Um, indeed, like going out into the unknown, uh, the deep blue, and that's where the spices are. That's where the riches are. Um, yeah. So in regards to you, uh, you've already established the, the, the need for adventure in the Portuguese culture, the infinite horizons, the ambition, the ingenuity. Um, but are there any other core cool values and ideas that uh, you can also add to that list? Sure. And actually, one of the driving factors um, in the age of exploration. So number one was obviously to find the spice route to India. And number two was um, a very Catholic um, influence. So as I mentioned earlier, the Portuguese were colonized by the Moors. And it was quite oppressive from their, the Portuguese point of view because they have to pay what's known as the jizya, which is like a tax on non-Islamic people under Islamic rule. Um, and after the Reconquista, the Portuguese really had an axe to grind with the Islamic world, understandably so. The, uh, another key aspect of their adventurous um, will was to find this mythical Eastern king called Prester John. So the Portuguese had heard that in the East somewhere, there was a Catholic king called Prester John. And the, when the Portuguese found him, or uh, would, would, when they thought they would find him, they thought that they would join forces with him and defeat the Islamic world. So that was another key thing. It was part of the, the, the very deep religious affinity that most Portuguese people still have. Um, so I, I think maybe you can see my, um, the shield of Portugal, and maybe you notice in between these little blue shields over here, there are five dots. And each of those dots represents one of the wounds in Christ's body. So his hands, his feet, and the spear in his side. So even um, in the crest, there is a deep religious um, influence in, in Portuguese culture. And that was a, also a driving force in the age of discovery and the age of co colonization. Um, there were two big aspects that the Portuguese wanted to spread. They wanted to spread their language and they wanted to spread their religion. Um, and the Portuguese were kind of unique among a lot of the colonial powers in that the Portuguese actually liked to intermix with the local people. So you, it was encouraged to take wives with anyone from anywhere, be it Africa, India, Indonesia, Timor, um, but on the condition that you made them Catholic and you got them to speak Portuguese. Hmm. Well, that's a, an interesting approach. And I think that's one of the reasons why Brazil is Portuguese and not Spanish today. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, and why the, the women there are so beautiful. <laughs> well, uh, Quentin, you've already shown the, the symbols on your, your crest there, um, but the, are there any other official and unofficial symbols of the Portuguese culture that uh, really resonate when a Portuguese person specifically sees that, that symbol, it just lets a spark go off in their mind? Um, well, one of them that's very well known, um, if you know Nando's, you know they have the chicken, and that's called uh, the cock of Barcelos. And the, the legend behind that is kind of that there was a man who was brought before the king, and the king was eating chicken for dinner, of course, as you do, peri peri chicken. Um, it's, you know, you guys all know it, it's the best. Um, and he was accused of a crime, but he was a very pious man. And he said to the king, my lord, if I'm innocent, may that chicken on your plate rise and sing. And the legend goes that he did. And that is kind of like a symbol of how your faith um, and coming clean can have good effects for you. And so that's a very well-known uh, symbol of, of Portugal. Hmm. 
And uh, that's actually interesting. A lot of people, our international viewers might not know, uh, Nando's is actually a South African uh, restaurant chain. It started over here, but it's a port specifically Portuguese uh, restaurant chain. And I think that's actually one of the big, uh, well, you could say cultural influences in South Africa is that peri-peri flavor that I think a lot of people associate with South Africa uh, has its roots in Portugal, but uh, it's already been completely embedded into South African cuisine as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would I would say yes. The, the the Portuguese brought it there, but it has its roots in India. Um, mm. And you know, I, I did spend uh, some time living in the Netherlands, as maybe some of our our viewers know. Um, and I'm glad that the Portuguese used the spices that they found in their cuisine. The Dutch seem to have just sold them because you don't find like uh, peri peri in Dutch cooking, but in Portuguese cooking, it's mm. very very prominent, a very prominent ingredient. And of course. I think Portuguese cuisine has had a massive influence in South Africa as well. Um, most people know of a Portuguese restaurant in their neighborhood, or they would have gone to a Portuguese festival at one of the Portuguese churches or even uh, Lusito land and experienced some of um, what our cuisine has to offer. Mm. Uh, not just uh, Portuguese, well, not just Portuguese restaurants, but uh, the classic fish and chips restaurant as well. Yes, Does that yes. also have a connection with the, the seafaring culture? Yeah, absolutely. Our Portuguese are some of the biggest consumers of seafood in Europe. Um, fantastic seafood here um, and has always been part of the diet, of course, because as I mentioned earlier, Portugal is a small country and what we have a lot of is the ocean. So fishing was a, a key part of the way people sustained themselves for many years. And that led to the obviously the naval um, experience that Portuguese people had in the shipwright, uh, shipbuilding experience and the great shipwrights that they had. Um, but you know, something quite cool about the whole Portuguese age of discovery is that there were only two cultures at the time that had the type of technology from a naval perspective to do what the Portuguese did. The one, of course, was Portugal and the other was China. But the Ming dynasty in the 1400s um, adopted kind of a policy of inward looking so in a, in a sense, it's kind of like a historical accident that the Portuguese were the first culture that brought globalization as we know it to the world. If the Chinese had, um, had decided to look outward instead of to look inward, I don't think the Portuguese could have competed with them in terms of just sheer manpower and resource uh, wealth. So again, like it's one of those strange accidents of history. Yeah. And you mentioned the, 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 the Portuguese festivals and uh, something that I learned while doing my research for this episode was that uh, the, the Portuguese community in South Africa uh, actually a, a hold an a, a annual festival called the Lusito, Lusito yep. Land, uh, the second yep. largest festival in South Africa. That's something I didn't know. Every year in the south of Joburg, you go there for espetada and caipirinha, which is a Brazilian drink, but still we claim it because it's delicious. Um, Farturas, which are like um, fried dough with cinnamon and sugar, like um, churros, kind of like the Spanish churros, but we invented them. Just like we invented churis as well. Um, they were still under Islamic occupation when we were allowed to eat pork, so... I'll claim the shuris for us too. So yeah, um, and Lusito Land, it, it has like, um, maybe a lot of people don't know this, it's not just a party to celebrate Portuguese culture, but it has um, a philanthropic element to it, which is that there is a home for people with lots of disabilities and stuff like that, Portuguese people. And the Lusito Festival is put on every year in order to raise funds to pay for that home. So. I think the Portuguese community has done a lot of that kind of trying to help uh, develop, you know, its members or help um, people that are down on their luck. Um, and that's something that I'm quite proud of that uh, they would do that. Yeah, but I think, yeah, that's something that you see when uh, cultural communities come together. You see a lot of good being done. Um, you see people coming together to pool their resources and to help people specifically within their community. And then it also kind of washes over into the surrounding communities as well. Uh, I think it's an immense positive uh, influence on any uh, urban center or even in a, in a rural town. I think having these types of cultural communities really not only enriches the, the area culturally, but it also does a lot of good. Because I think there is, 
I can't really uh, explain exactly why this is, but there is this inward mem or this this momentum within a cultural movement to try and improve the area, improve the community, improve the surroundings, and to to help people in need. I think it's something when people come together, it's just an uh, inherent thing that we want to do. And maybe with your psychological background, you can give us a bit more insight on that. Yeah, I think um, for sure it is. It is kind of the thing of, you know, um, your in-group, you, you do tend to prefer people from your in-group. Um, and a lot of it is practical. I mean, it's a linguistic thing uh, as much as it is a cultural thing. So um, the story of the Portuguese in South Africa is a kind of also like the story of the, the Portuguese age of discovery is that um, most of the Portuguese that are in South Africa now have roots that go probably from the 50s probably early 50s to about the 60s. Um, so my grandparents from both sides are actually from Madeira. So they all came in the late 50s, early 60s as well. And at the time, Portugal was a very poor country in, in, in comparison to other countries in, in Western Europe. Um, and it was, uh, it was kind of under a, a dictatorship at the time, some people call it a fascist dictatorship, but the it wasn't a fascist state. It was an authoritarian state for sure. Um, and it was quite underdeveloped compared to the rest of Europe and had been bankrupted in its past a couple of times. Now, that authoritarian state was um, run by a guy called Antonio Salazar, who is a very, very interesting figure, actually. But yeah, he is recommended that I read up on this man. Yeah, he's a very, very interesting figure. Like he was a poor farmer, um, but brilliant mind. And he was actually recruited from a university to run the country. Um, he was an economist. And he is the only person to ever balance Portugal's books. Okay. Um, so uh, to make a long story short, um, the Portuguese had to kind of seek opportunities elsewhere. And especially Madeira. Madeira is an island, of course, not a lot going on there at the time. Um, a lot of farming and stuff. So my family also has a long history of going other places. Like my grandfather's, uh, sorry, my grandmother's father, my great grandfather, um, he was a rum smuggler in Curaçao when he was young. So he it was a bootlegger, kind of like a pirate. Um, and he made rum in Curaçao and then was caught and banned from the country for 10 years. So he went back to Madeira and bought a farm and started to farm. And then when he was allowed to farm again, he went back, uh, sorry, allowed to go back to Kurasan, he went back and and worked on oil tankers and stuff like that there for for, for Shell, I think it was, because it's a Dutch territory. And then um, my grandfathers both came to South Africa and none of my grandparents had more than a primary school education. Um, and they all went into business. So the fruit, uh, the fruit shops, the fish and chip shops, the bottle stores, the butcheries that was kind of like the, the Portuguese niche that uh, tried to do something, and the community. So, quickly, we just lost you there for one second. Can you just repeat uh, the, that sort of the, the Portuguese niche? Oh, yeah, so the, the Portuguese niche uh, in businesses like fruit shops, butcheries, uh, liquor stores, um, and also quite a bit of farming. Um, the, then the community would build little community centers and clubs. So Johannesburg, where, where I'm from, there was like Union Nevada, or called Union. Then in the East Rand, there was Casa dos Poveres, close to uh, East Rand Mall. Um, and a whole bunch of these little Portuguese cultural clubs would go, and then the guys would go there after work and join, and then, you know, like do business together as well. And so they sort of started to build up from there, and eventually bigger Portuguese organizations came about, uh, like um, the South African Portuguese Chamber of Commerce, which is really great, like helps Portuguese business people. Um, and then I forgot the name of this other organization, but my parents were part of it. And it's also like one of the challenges that the Portuguese community have faced. And it's also one of the reasons why I feel like a very close affinity with the Afrikaans community and with what the farmers go through is because the Portuguese community, obviously being in business, um, they've had a lot of trouble, you know, um, violent crime has affected my family. I've lost my uncle and my father to violent crime in their businesses. Um, I know many, many people who've gone through the same. 
Um, and so there was a community uh, initiative started up to help to, to petition the South African government for, you know, better policing. And I'll never forget, like I was a young guy passed away. He was shot in his business. And um, Steve Twitter, in, in Brentwood Park and, you know, the Portuguese were like, you know, we have to do something about the, the uh, crime. Excuse me, Quentin, and just they go started back, their own uh, let's go back five seconds uh, to uh, the start of this story. Uh, you just broke up there for one second. Oh, sure. Uh, so um, I was saying that um, yeah, Steve Twechwe, um mm. the Portuguese community kind of petitioned the government and Steve Twechwe, who was the minister of police at the time, came to our church in Brentwood Park and um, he was, you know, we we were talking of ways that we could solve the crime thing. And eventually, I think, you know, a lot of the Portuguese businessmen in certain areas started to do like uh, little chains of communication. This was before the days of WhatsApp and stuff like that. Like, you know, who can we call in this area if there's a problem and, you know, trying to help. Um, so it, it was always part of the thing of like, go somewhere, find people that are like you. Um, do business together um, and support each other's community. And the Portuguese have done that um, with quite some success in South Africa. If I can just say one thing again, sorry, I, I'm going to ramble about the whole time. So just be yeah, absolutely uh, be my guest, Quentin. You are the guest. <laughs> yeah. So uh, people make a little bit of a joke about the fish and chip shop and for, for good reason. I mean, the stereotypes are funny and I, I like a good joke and I can laugh at that kind of thing. But the biggest hotel chain in Portugal, they're called Pristana. That means eyelash. And there's a funny story behind this. But um, they were Madeleine's Portuguese that went to South Africa, made fish and, fish and chip shops, send their money over, and now have the biggest hotel chain in Portugal. So, um, yeah, I think there, there is something to be said for, you know, like um, the adventurous spirit and what you can do when you're um, when you have a little bit of balls to go and, Go get what you want. Yeah. Well, uh, Quentin, there's a question from the chat. Uh, Muluri Hanyane asks, what relationship do the South African Portuguese have with the Portuguese in Mozambique? Um, I think a pretty close one. I mean, a lot of, so I also have family that went to Mozambique. Um, I have family that went to Angola and also have family that went to Venezuela. So those are pretty big Portuguese communities. Um, and yeah, look, after the, I think it was 75 because the Portuguese state collapsed or there was a revolution, the Carnation Revolution in 75. Um, and they lost hold of their colonies. Um, a lot of the Portuguese from Mozambique also came to South Africa. So there's always been kind of a, a support and a good relationship. It's, it's never any kind of tension between the Portuguese. Like there might be a little bit of jokes about you come from the island, you come from the mainland, you have a weird accent type of thing. Um, but um, generally, they supported each other and helped each other out, um, especially when, you know, people fled from Angola and Mozambique in pretty bad circumstances. Mm. Uh, I see uh, uh, Herman Ruiz. Uh, it's my uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Herman. Uh, your absolutely uh, always uh, on point when you come listen to my shows thank you very much uh, for the support um and i hope to see you soon i know uh, Herman Ruiz? excuse me quentin was that Herman Ruiz? yes oh Herman's a oh. <laughs> yeah he's uh, invited me to come visit and i'll definitely take him up on his offer um so yeah, uh, to get back to actually one of the things that uh, I find very interesting is that in my experience, Portuguese South Africans speak English. They don't speak Portuguese. Uh, what's the reasoning behind that? Um, I think it, it depends. So I speak Portuguese, um, but my younger brother doesn't speak a word. And it's kind of weird. Um, and then I have cousins that speak fluent like their brothers and sisters don't speak at all. So it, for me, it was a little bit of a weird situation because when my, my mom always complained, like when she was young and had to go to school, she didn't speak a word of English and she had a lot of trouble with that. Um, and so she wanted us to speak English at home and she wanted us to be educated in English. So with my parents, we spoke English, but my grandparents used to come and live with us for six months of the year. And with them, we spoke Portuguese. 
And, and the reason I speak more than my brother is when I was a baby, I was brought to Portugal and I think I stayed here for about six months. Like I was about two years old. And apparently, I don't remember, of course, but apparently when I left, I was speaking a lot of Portuguese. I think I was just in that window where the brain is so plastic and you learn the language very well. And then I took an interest in it. And throughout school, the Portuguese consulate would send Portuguese teachers to different schools and give you extra Portuguese classes after school. And I like that. So I would always go. And so I speak pretty good Portuguese. It's not an easy language, but I get by fine here in Portugal with it. Um, my younger brother hardly speaks any. Um, but yeah, at home, uh, it, I, it kind of just depends on your family situation. My family was pretty, pretty much strict with the English, but I'm glad I've got some, uh, some background. And then I have other yeah friends that are super fluent um, and who only speak with their parents in Portuguese. So mm. yeah, I guess it just depends. Mm. Are there any Portuguese schools in South Africa? No, not that I know of. And that's actually something that the Greeks have on us because I know the Greeks have got some good Greek schools. Uh, and the Portuguese never never did that. I don't know why. Um, I've actually noticed a disparity in, in how the communities value education. I think uh, for my generation um, and my friends, like our parents put much more, uh, in, uh, let's say, pressure on us academically. But my parents' generation, there was none of that. It was like, when can you get out of school and come to the shop, you know? Um, and in fact, even my, as, as much as I said, my father and my parents put a lot of pressure on me academically to get a degree and stuff like that. Um, from the age of 12, every Friday, I was at my father's business uh, at his shop and school holidays. I had to spend at least a week of the holidays at his shop and he was trying to teach me, you know, the ropes. Um, mm. But in my, my parents' generation, most of them just took over the businesses from their family or started their own. And that's kind of what happened with my, with my family. Mm. Uh, in my experience uh, with Portuguese businesses, uh, no matter how many employees they have, there's always a family member behind the cash register. Yeah, you have to be there. Like my dad used to call it playing piano. And he says, I have a BSC uh, behind shop counter. So BSC playing the piano and, um, you know, yeah, that's where you see everything that's going on. Like the shop is kind of set up. So where the cash register is, you've got a good view of everything and you always secure the bag. That's, that's number one rule of business. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've covered, uh, your cultural values. We've covered some of the more, uh, historical elements of it. Um, but something else that I think is very interesting that I ask all my guests in this series is the, the question of cultural heroes. Um, growing up in a Portuguese uh, household, were, who were some of the standout Portuguese heroes that you can recall? Um, well, uh, so my personal Portuguese hero, I've named myself after him, is Afonso Albuquerque, the Duke of Goa, the Lion of the Indian Ocean, who is the greatest admiral ever in the history of naval combat. Um, so, but my parents didn't used to talk about that. My parents' heroes were football players and musicians. Um, so a very uh, prominent Portuguese, we have this type of music called fado, which again is kind of related to the ocean. Um, in Portugal, there's this feeling called saudade, which is kind of like a, a bittersweet longing. And that was kind of the feeling that you left Portugal on the boat and you never knew if you were going to see it again. And the people that stayed behind and had that feeling of saudade, they made um, songs about their lost loves. And a very prominent uh, singer, her name was Amalia Rodrigues. So she was a big um, influence in my household. My parents would always play her music and stuff like that. Um, so that was a cultural hero that we had. Um, and another interesting, uh, another cultural hero of mine that I discovered later in life is Portuguese poet Fernando Pessoa. And now Fernando Pessoa spent a lot of time in South Africa. So he wrote in English and Portuguese. His mother married the um, governor of Natal at the, at the time, uh, and he moved to South Africa. N and actually, the word Natal comes from Portuguese too, because we discovered that place at Christmas time, and Natal means Christmas in Portuguese. <laughs> so um, well, that's something I didn't know. Yeah. So um, those were my sort of cultural heroes. Um, Growing up, uh, Luis Figo, um, Amalia Rodrigues. Uh, later on, I discovered, you know, the 
Bartholomew Diaz's and the naval heroes of Portugal. Um, going to the Cape, we went to the Cape of Good Hope, Cape Point, where the, the stone structure, which we call a padrão, uh, it's, still, it's still there. Um, and, you know, like I learned a little bit about the history from, from my parents. They weren't like scholarly people, though. So they would just say, oh, look, this is, we discovered this place. Uh, oh, cool. We, yeah, okay. Yeah. The funny so, thing for me is uh, when, uh, well, uh, when uh, black nationalists in South Africa in a derogatory sense call white South Africa in 1652 as uh, they uh, not, they haven't discovered yet that you're the 1488ers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we're even, uh, we should actually get the same kind of ire. I feel a little bit left out that I'm not called the 1488er. Mm. No, that's interesting. Something you mentioned there, the, uh, what was it called? Those stone structures, the... Yeah, one is called the Pedrão and many are called mm -hmm. Pedrões. Yeah. So also, uh, while I was doing my research for this episode, um, I found out, uh, so they erected these Pedraos, a large stone, cro a large stone cross inscribed with the coat of arms of Portugal. Um, and they placed that as a claim to that land. Uh, and this actually leads us into the next theme that I wanted to discuss, and that's the, the central myths and legends uh, that fuel the Portuguese culture. And maybe you can lead into that with these uh, padras as almost a, a symbol of this, this mythic thinking of exploration. Sure. Well, as I mentioned, uh, there was the, the necessity to find a way out of Portugal's a relatively impoverished situation at the time. So the exploration was there and the, the Christian element or specifically the Catholic element of looking for Preston John. Um, so the Portuguese really were driven by that. It was like kind of a cultural obsession. Everything went into finding other places, right? Um, and I, I think um, th those are sort of they were the central myths of that time. But later on in history, um, it, when Portugal had become an empire, the, the myth kind of changed uh, to maintain the status of the empire. So it was kind of like an underdog syndrome. But then when they became an empire, uh, they put a lot of time and effort into maintaining the empire. And the loss of Brazil was a massive blow to Portugal. Uh, as was a fire that uh, rocked Lisbon, an earthquake and fire in 1755, I think it was. Um, so the Portuguese power started to wane after that, but the idea of maintaining an empire was still so strong up until the time of Salazar. And so that was one of Salazar's, in my opinion, big, big mistakes, is that he tried to hold on to colonies that he should have emancipated. Um, the rest of Europe was emancipating their colonies at the time. Um, and so it, it kind of, there was this kind of greed element to it, of course. I mean, it's, it's colonialism. That's what it's about at the end of the day. Um, and Afonso Albuquerque, um, in his memoirs, when he found India and was governing over Goa, he said something about um, nations that become, this book is great, by the way. It has all about um, the Portuguese naval empire. But if I can just find this passage real quickly, at the end when he talks about like how the Portuguese uh, had the potential to become oppressors all the way back in the early 1500s. So in the walls of Ormuz, which was in the Straits of Malacca, which is modern day Indonesia, he said that um, so long as the laws are upheld by justice and without oppression, they are more than sufficient. But if good faith and humanity cease to be observed in these lands, then pride will overthrow the strongest walls we have. Portugal is very poor, and when the poor are covetous, they become oppressors. The fumes of India are powerful. I fear the time will come when instead of our present fame as warriors, we may only be known as grasping tyrants. So I think that was super prescient, and that, that kind of set the stage for modern Portugal as it is, because a lot of resources and a lot of lives were put into upholding the colonies, and then when the revolution in 1975 happened, which was a peaceful revolution, um, Portugal had lost all their colonies and their colonies uh, in Africa, unfortunately, fell to Marxists. And of course, we know what happens when Marxists get in charge. Portugal almost fell to the Marxists as well. And that was a big blow to Portugal. Um, and so Portugal was then kind of the sick man of Europe for a while. And... 
I guess the, the, the myth of the impoverished nation that becomes the grasping tyrant um, resonates, I think, today. Um, people are not so, let's say, um, vocal about their pride for their heritage. And Portugal is kind of now seen as this poor underdog that has to rely on the Germans to bail us out the whole time. And I, this manifests in strange ways, for instance, like in my opinion, I mean, I'm not like a gourmand or something like that, but Portuguese cuisine is super underrated. South Africa no, knows about it, but Europeans have no idea. South Africa is in on the secret. Yeah, South Africa is in on the secret, exactly. But most Europeans don't really know anything about it. The same with Portuguese wines. Portuguese wines are really great. And we have mm. like our own sort of, it's not champagne, but we have our own particular sure. type of wines that are only found here, like port wine and what we call vin verde, which is a, a type of wine that uh, uh, it's, it's slightly bubbly and quite weak in alcohol. Um, and it's only grown in specific places in Portugal and it's delicious. But the Portuguese don't like market this stuff to Europe and the rest of the world. They kind of have this mm, sort of, oh, we don't want to be too proud of what we've got. Um, and so that's now kind of, um, I guess, the identity struggle that Portugal has. Well, Quentin, uh, the Portuguese do commit uh, a food crime, and that is mixing red wine with Coke. Can you enlighten us on that? <laughs> do you know what, man? I hate that, and my grandfather to this day drinks it every day for lunch. And he goes it's to a lane for it. It's called a Katemp, and it comes from a place in Mozambique called Katemp. And then they, it was the Mozambicans that really honestly drank too much um, and, and did that one day. I, I agree, it's a crime, total crime, total shame. But to this day, my grandfather pulls a tumbler this big with red wine. And then he tops it off with Coke. And he goes, um, oh, the doctors say I can have one glass of wine every day. But don't say how big can the glass be. <laughs> <laughs> Man, no, that's something that I've, that I've realized is that uh, some, some, cult some cultural clashes just can't be reconciled. No, no, um, yeah, that, you got me on that one, man. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, um, you said you grew up uh, in a, a household that was influenced uh, by Portuguese culture. Um, can you tell us, is there anything else you want to go into, specifically maybe the, the influence of your, your father's cultural elements and the, 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 the values that were instilled in you, specifically growing up in that type of household? What made it unique for you? Sure. Um, so in, in my household, and I think a lot of Portuguese, there was a strong sense of like, you must know at least where you come from. You know, must know something about it, uh, whether that's the language, but religion was also a very important thing. So uh, the vast majority of Portuguese people are Catholic. And so there was kind of like a mix of the religion and culture. So sometimes we would go to the Portuguese church, sometimes we'd go to the English church. And um, that was very, very uh, deeply instilled in me. Like I had a strong, strong religious upbringing at home. Um, uh, another thing that my my father especially tried to instill in me uh, is work hard. Um, and my dad is just one of the hardest working people I ever met. Like um, in his first business that my father actually invented, you know those split brides that you see with the gas panels at the yeah. back? My father's best friend was a metal metallurgist and so he built one and it was my dad's idea. And his, his first butchery um, in Kempton Park was called Kojak because my dad's bald like me. So Kojak was like this bald dude like in the TV show or something like that. I don't really know. And so he called his butchery Kojak and he started um, renting out those spit brides to everyone and it kind of caught on. Um, well, that's so another cultural impact you've had on South Africa then. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, but my dad would like, he'd leave work at 6.30 in the morning to go to the shop. Sometimes earlier if you had to go to the market to get stock. And he'd be back home, it's half past seven, eight o'clock. And it seemed like the older he got, the harder he worked, unfortunately. Um, and, you know, business is up and down. So sometimes the business would be going great guns. Uh, sometimes things would happen and it wouldn't be going so great. Uh, when he cha He's changed businesses a few times. And um, before he passed away, he was working. Um, in a, we had a family business with, like, uh, my mom's side of the family in Hillbrow. And um, he would leave at at yeah, hop at six in the morning, get back nine o'clock at night and work two weeks before he got two days off. Um, so he was 
he instilled that in me, like you have to work for what you get. And I, I don't know any Portuguese people whose parents had shops that weren't somehow kind of, you know, brought in there at some point, like, hey, now you're going to work for your whatever pocket money you may get or something like that. So there was nothing for Mahala. Um, and I think that served me very well growing up. I didn't like it at the time, of course. But now looking back, that's something that I'm grateful that my parents instilled in me. Um, also, like um, sports, my, my, my family loved football. Um, it's a big thing, obviously, in, uh, in Portugal. But, you know, like my dad hated it if you didn't try hard. So that was just the thing, like just try hard, work hard. Um, and, you know, um, be proud when you do something good. That was kind of their um the way that they raised me and be proud of where you come from. There's no shame in, you know, you know, coming from a family that's not educated. Um, that was also a big thing. Like you can go and be educated, but don't feel ashamed that you come from, you know, people that have a humble way of making their way in the world. And so that was cool. Like not, you know, like, um, I, that's why I also have lots of respect for anyone in any profession who makes a go of it, no matter like how humble it might be, I think it's like honor and a beauty in that. Uh, just two things I want to address in the comments. Uh, LM asked, where did Portugal colonize in Africa? If I'm correct, that's Angola and Mozambique. And, and, then, uh, and the Cabo Verde. And um, there was actually, I think part of Zimbabwe for a while, but then they sold it to the British, I think. Hmm. Well, I'm going to have to go look at that history. I'm not aware of that, but that would be very fascinating. Yeah, because they uh, joined between Angola and Mozambique. They had the middle part, but then they sold it to England. Hmm. And then Carlos Castrejo says, uh, Portugal is just now starting to commercialize our wines, our reds, and our verino and uh, uh, vajino verde with higher alcohol content than the normal vino verde. Okay. Yeah, well, like I said, they weren't marketing them, and uh, there's such a market in Europe for it. And it's of good quality, as good as any other wine, you know? Mm. Well, yeah, I've had some Portuguese wine. It's definitely uh, definitely top class. I can vouch for it. So in regards to uh, the Portuguese in South Africa, um, you having experienced that community, how does the Portuguese community in South Africa get on with the other cultures in South Africa? Now, there are dozens of other cultures here. And I know specifically there's a good relationship between the Greeks and the Italians and any other um, well culture in South Africa that has roots in the Mediterranean with the Portuguese community. Um, but can you enlighten us a bit more in regards to those intercultural relations uh, in South Africa, specifically with your community? Uh, Quentin's just frozen there. Let's give him one second. Uh, Sorry. Uh, hey, Quentin, did you get my question? Uh, no, I didn't get it. I said right. only as far as, as far as the Portuguese community in South Africa. So, mm. so uh, just to repeat that question, as far as the Portuguese community in South Africa goes, uh, how is the community's relation to other cultures? I mean, South Africa has dozens of cultures, and I know specifically there's a good relationship between the, the cultures of Mediterranean origin, like the Italians in South Africa, yeah. but also with the Greeks. Um, what can you tell us a bit about uh, the Portuguese community in South Africa's uh, relation to the cultures around them? Sure. Well, I think initially, maybe the first two generations, the community was a lot more insular than it is today. Um, so I have more friends that aren't of Portuguese origin than I do of Portuguese origin, just to give you an idea. But I know my parents' generation, the Mediterraneans, or as I like to call them, the olive oil people, mostly stuck together. And there was a sort of a sense of being outsiders and not quite fitting in type of thing. So the Greeks, the Portuguese, the Italians... I guess, uh, you know, they share that, that olive oil Mediterranean culture. Uh, so it was easier to get along. Um, but, you know, funny enough, like, I don't know. I learned also something interesting, like, because obviously my, my father's business, most of the people that went there and most of the work there were black people. And there was such a great spirit of camaraderie, um, at, at least in my father's businesses. Maybe some people have had other experiences. But, you know, like, we're in this kind of thing together. Um, we're here to, you know, like, help each other out. My dad would help his staff out when they needed help. 
um, you know, and they helped him out, of course, um, and respected each other and looked after each other. Um, my grandfather, he's 90 now, but he speaks funny galore. And my father's father spoke fluent Zulu. My father spoke fluent Zulu. So I think um, on that level, although in my parents' generation, there wasn't a social element. Like, I think at least in the workplace, people got along really, really well. And the respect was there enough that, you know, um, my family would learn an African language. I don't, uh, I don't even know another African language outside of Afrikaans, you know. So um, I think they get along well. And I think as my generation obviously uh, went out into the world, um, it was, yeah, just everyone's cool. As long as you're cool with me, I'm cool with you. Um, I have some Portuguese friends. There was like a bit of a pressure on who to get married to, but I got married to someone who has at least some Italian heritage. So um, that was like, okay, she's Italian, she's Catholic. She's got olives in her blood. She's got olive oil, yeah, you get a pass. Um, but there was pressure in my family to, to, to marry a Portuguese person. Um, but uh, a lot of my other Portuguese friends, you know, just um, whoever you fall in love with is who you fall in love with. So I think now the Portuguese community is um, integrated super well and get along with whoever we get along with. Yeah, mm. uh, especially with the anyone that can help them uh, with their business. So yeah. um, I just want to uh, say thank you very much to LM. He just gave two pounds and he said, "I like the videos, man. Thank you very much. I appreciate it." So. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is you said that uh, there's a strong Catholic influence in uh, in the Portuguese, well, in Portugal, um, but is that the, the case in South Africa as well? Yeah, I think so. I only knew one Portuguese friend of mine who was a Mormon, and that was only because he said his mom was a Mormon and they offered him sweets to go to church. But every other Portuguese person I knew was Catholic, and it's the majority of religion still today in Portugal. Right, and there's something that you sent me before the show, uh, a meme uh, that I want to unload on the audience. Uh, let me just get this here. Uh, where is it now? One second. Uh, here we go. All right. So this is going to lead us into the, the final topic of discussion for tonight, and that is the, the Portuguese culture in South Africa today regards to its challenges and the way forward but before we continue you can just you just explain this meme please okay so why this meme is is funny to me at least is that yeah it plays on the whole you know portugal being the global empire and now portugal is not even the place where the most people speak portuguese um so the beautiful islands that the portuguese found in the 1500s madeira the Açores, and indonesia and all over the world but now in Portugal, in 2020, every time you hear, especially Americans speaking about Portuguese, they speak with a Brazilian accent or they say the words the way a Brazilian would. And like when you're trying to use a dictionary in word to type, you've got the Portuguese from Brazil and it's supposed to be the language of Portugal, but it's now known, it has more speakers outside of Portugal than it does inside of Portugal. And so Portugal in that sense um, has fallen from grace. Um, I would say. And yeah, it's kind of funny because, you know, now all we have to be proud of essentially, uh, as the meme suggests, is the football team and a language that's spoken by a lot of people. We don't, we don't have, um, you know, free reign to go and find beautiful islands anymore, unfortunately. Mm. All right. Wait. There we go. All right. So before we continue into the, the state of the culture today, uh, there's just some comments that I want to highlight that I really enjoyed. It's uh, our friend Odin Moja, who says a wholesome stream. Oh, my man. And then here's an interesting one that I think we need to get into before we get into that last topic. And that's from uh, Cornel Janssen van Rensburg, who says, Ferreira is natuurlijk ook een algemene Afrikaanse fan, van of Portugees. Ons het zelfs een volksliedje voor die naam Ferreira. So just to translate that, that for you guys, he says, um, Ferreira, Quentin's surname, is also a common Afrikaans surname from Portuguese origin. Uh, we even in Afrikaner culture have a song about Ferreira. Now, uh, Quentin, you are familiar with the song. I do know the song, Fatio Goed en Trak Ferreira. Yeah. Um, you, you people will tell me that my whole life. Every single one of my Afrikaans teachers would, would get me with that one all the time. Mm -hmm. So you, you sent me an article a while ago about um, the origins of that, hey? Yeah. yeah. 
Um, right. Ja, so, hey, natuurlijk, de Portugies uh, het lekker aangegaan met die Afrikaanse meisjes ook mm. op oomlijk. Ja, yeah, yeah. so it's, uh, it's that what you described earlier, the, the Portuguese tendency to uh, not really have a, a prejudice to who they intermingle with, and uh, then the Afrikaners wrote an entire song about it. Yeah. <laughs> but probably if you if you expand it a little bit, it's probably, if you, the image comes to mind of just this very, uh, very gruff Afrikaans whim uh, chasing this uh, this poor guy off his stoop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So in regards to that last theme, uh, the Portuguese today, specifically in South Africa, the culture is uh, what it is today. There's now 300,000 uh, Portuguese South Africans, roughly in South Africa. Um, what can you tell us about uh, the culture's situation today in uh, 2021? Yeah, I think the parts of the culture are still quite vibrant, you know, but we've lost that sort of thing that my parents and my grandparents' generation had of cultural organizations like there was no such thing as that when I was growing up the, the Portuguese clubs where you know the old the old toppies would go there and play cards all the time and my parents would go there for lunches from time to time that sort of died away um, so I guess the and again maybe the business side of things a lot of my friends some some did you know take go into business and take over their family businesses. But as I said, in my generation, there was more of a pressure to go to university and study and stuff like that. Um, so I think those kind of things, the, the way that the Portuguese community probably traditionally made its way in the world in South Africa is changing. Um, the way that the community joins with one another is changing. Like it's probably not only at churches or probably more with family. Um, uh, I hope the, the younger generation retain an interest in, in learning the language. But I think the challenge of the Portuguese community is, is going to be kind of the same challenge as many other uh, smaller ethnic and linguistic communities in South Africa, which is that you, you need to resist the kind of the, the ideological urge from the ANC to make everything into like this flat monoculture of kind of de facto sort of Englishness you know, um, and they Anglicization. really, yeah, exactly. That kind of the de facto anglicization and, you know, stripping people of their pride in history, um, making people feel guilty, especially people of a 1488 or 1652 extraction for, you know, their history that, um, you know, brought suffering to indigenous African people. Um, so I think, that, you know, the Portuguese need to retain some kind of, um, uh, hope um, and, you know, really look at how your forefathers maybe um, made their way and joined together and um, in a better way. So the Portuguese Chamber of Commerce still does that, still tries to help each other out. But yeah, I mean, I'm guilty of it as anyone else. I don't, I didn't belong to any organization that didn't do anything like that. Um, so um, yeah, but if any Portuguese people are out there, um, and want to, or anyone basically, but um, you know, and and want to maybe talk to me about that. I'd be happy to to get involved with something like that. Mm. I see. Uh, I've got a super chat from JC, uh, but I can't read it. You're gonna have to to translate here, Quentin, and be honest. Okay. So Jesse says, "Obrigado pelo chat," which is thank you for the chat. Feliz Quentin, ainda está por aí. So happy, he's happy that I'm still here uh, in Portugal. Ainda estou aqui, Jesse. Muito obrigado. Uh, yeah, I I know Jesse from Twitter, um, and now I'm a persona non grata on the internet for interfering in U.S. elections. So yeah, uh, you. I mean, it's been confirmed that you're Q himself. So uh, exactly. that's a, that's a bit of a bugger for your <laughs> reputation. Um, there was a, a bit of a, a interesting question here that I wanted to maybe uh, end off with uh, before we go into the final thoughts. Uh, the freighter watcher asks, what do you consider to be the best traits of traditional Portuguese women? Hmm. Um, they're, they're cooking. Um, they have like really strong family and maternal instincts, I would say. Um, Portuguese women are a little bit crazy. Like a Portuguese woman is not a pushover. That's for sure. 
Um, and I don't know if you like that or you don't like that, um, but a Portuguese woman will tell you uh, where to get off, especially if she was a daddy's girl. Like um, that was one of the things that actually I didn't like about, you know, Portuguese girls. Why I didn't like to date them is because like, um, you know, the that daddy's girl kind of thing. Um, but I, I'm generalizing, of course. Um, but the traditional Portuguese woman is a great mother, uh, a great and she's like the neck that the man is the head of the house, but the Portuguese woman turns it. She's the neck, you know? So and that's how I would describe it. Um, for sure. Um, they're not feminists, but they're very, very strong women. I mean, um, the, unfortunately many Portuguese women were left without, were, were left widowed, um, because of all the crime that, uh, that has befallen our community. And every time, the moms sacrifice everything for the kid. My mom did it for my brother and I, my aunt did it for, for my cousins. And yeah, there's something definitely super admirable. I see uh, my grandmother, you know, like um, for her, for her husband, um, as much as, you know, they bicker and whatever, like there is a sense of duty, a real sense of like, this is my role as woman. Um, and I like that, uh, that traditional way of looking at, at things. And yeah, I have a, uh, out of respect and fear for Portuguese women. <laughs> well, uh, it was a very light-hearted question, but uh, you gave a very, a very interesting answer, Quentin. So, as we approach the end of the conversation, um, my last thing that I think you can incorporate into your final thoughts is the theme of this series, this culture series of mine. That's the theme of why culture is important and why it's important to know and be aware of the different cultures around you. I mean. That's one of the big mistakes that a lot of foreigners make when they look at South Africa. They just see it in terms of black and white, but it can't be farther from the truth. And that's one of the reasons why uh, I started this series is to actually prove uh, what's going on in South Africa and to, to prove the point that if you don't look at South Africa through a cultural lens, um, things aren't going to make sense to you. They're, it's going to look like some fever dream, bizarro world. So my fi the final thoughts that I want from you here, Quentin, is... Uh, can you give me your thoughts on the importance of culture and the sentiments that I just uh, expressed as your final thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I'll go back to what I said about, you know, kind of resisting the urge to, of certain people to create a monoculture for um, nefarious purposes, especially when it's in the hands of the state. Culture, um, it gives you a sort of basis for seeing the world in a certain way. And um, I'm a big fan of the Lindy effect, which is that if something has gone on for a long period of time, it survived the test of time and there's a reason for it. And I think the, the success such as it, as it has been of the Portuguese culture in South Africa is because they kind of became in a way more Catholic than the Pope. I don't mean that in the religious sense, but like any immigrant community that leaves their their country they kind of go extreme you know and it takes a few generations to kind of you know become more integrated but they really hold on tightly to their values and their culture and to the extent that they might create a little bubble around them but those things did serve them when times were super tough and when no one knew what was going on in in a, la in a country where you don't speak the language and you weren't exactly welcome but you had a role to play um holding on to the values of family, uh, the values of hard work, the values of community can get you through that and help you thrive in, um, in a new environment, in a hostile environment. Um, and so I would say that it's super important to know who you are, where you're from, and don't let someone else decide that for you. And the only way you can do that is by um, integrating your cultural identity within yourself as well. I think that's a perfect way to end it, Quentin. I think that's a very strong, very strong sentiment. Um, thank you very much for... Excuse me? I have a good joke. Actually, it's a terrible joke, but I really want to tell it to end it. Okay, so let's end on a joke. I'll, I'll take the, the leap of faith. Okay. So this joke kind of also sums up a lot about the Portuguese community. So Manny is very sick. And Manny, he's gone to hospital. And... He's sitting there in the hospital bed and his wife comes to visit him and she says, Oh, Manny, my creed husband. Oh, I don't like to see you like this. And he says, Oh, Maria, my beautiful wife. Uh, 
you didn't bring Pashtej Nata, but it's okay. I'm so glad to see you here. And then his daughter runs in. Oh, Daddy, I don't like to see you so sick. He says, Ah, oh, Maria, my beautiful daughter. Oh, you don't worry, your daddy's going to be fine. But, you know, please don't cry. Everything's going to be okay. And then his son, Juan, comes in. Daddy, I'm so sorry. What's going on? He says, Ah, oh, Juan. Ah, oh, my son, my beautiful male heir that will bring my name forward through the generations. Don't worry, Papa's going to be fine. Everything's okay. Oh, but I see you all here, my family, my wife, my daughter, my beautiful son. Everyone's here for me. But who's watching the show? <laughs> no, I think that's perfect. I think that absolutely sums up everything you've uh, you've enlightened us uh, on tonight. So, uh, Mr. Ferreira, thank you very much for your time. It's always a pleasure to have you on the channel. There's a reason why you're the most featured guest uh, on here and there's definitely going to be more episodes in the future so thank you very much i learned a lot i didn't know that uh, the word natal or the name of natal came from as uh, portuguese origins and i can use that as a, a nice little trivia and hopefully somewhere in the future in a quiz at a quiz night uh, i can get those points awesome well i hope they don't uh, rename it uh, at some point because of that <laughs> But yeah, thanks so well, much. That's for interesting because the 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 Boers actually called that uh, that piece of land Natalia in the end uh, when they oh, yes. uh, when the Boers lived there. So that Portuguese influence stayed there. And long may it continue. And yeah, thank you so much for for the invite, man. It's been such a pleasure chatting to you. Hmm. No, always a pleasure, Quentin. And lastly, thank you very much for everyone that tuned in. Uh, thank you for all your very uh, interesting and funny comments. Uh, thank you for your questions. I always like that uh, you show up for these long format conversations and you take part. Uh, you of you form part of the content, and I appreciate that very much. Um, I also just want to remind you that I have a Telegram channel where you can keep up to date with all my latest episodes and news. Um, there's a link in the description. Uh, there's also uh another thing uh, that uh, will help out the channel a lot and that's if you leave a like on this uh, episode uh, if you're new to this channel and you like these types of conversations and want to watch future culture series episodes uh you can uh, click subscribe and then uh, i hope everyone has an excellent night uh, excellent week going forward good luck at work or at school at university tomorrow and uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend god bless ciao